Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Chicago Law School's fifth session of our weekly summer discussion on policing. I am Emily Buss, a faculty member at the law school, serving as the moderator for this series. One of the law school's important areas of academic research and clinical advocacy is policing and police reform. The goal of this series is to give our faculty the opportunity to share their work and to give our community the chance to discuss how these ideas relate to current efforts to reform policing. The sessions are designed to allow considerable time for questions, questions that can inspire future research to address issues that you help us to identify. This week's session focuses on race, equal protection, and policing. And today's speakers are Allison Siegler and Aziz Huck. By now, some of you are very familiar with our ground rules. I will introduce each speaker, after which the speaker will have roughly 12 minutes to speak. At approximately 12.30, we will turn to questions. Please send any questions you have, and as soon as you have them, to me by chat. So me specifically, Emily Buss. I will do my best to ask as many of your questions as I can with a focus on those most related to today's topic. I am pleased to begin today's discussion by introducing our first speaker, Allison Siegler. Allison is a clinical professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School, where she founded and directs the Federal Criminal Justice Clinic, FCJC, the nation's first legal clinic solely devoted to representing indigent clients charged with federal felonies. Her clinic defends individual clients and pursues impact litigation in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and before the United States Supreme Court. FCJC also works to reduce mass incarceration to combat racial disparities and reform the federal criminal legal system. The clinic's groundbreaking breaking, excuse me, federal race discrimination litigation garnered nationwide recognition, including the Clinical Legal Education Association's 2020 award for excellence. Before founding the FCJC, Professor Siegler served as an attorney with the Federal Defender Program in Chicago, a Prettyman Fellow at Georgetown University's Law Center's Criminal Justice Clinic, and as a law clerk for United States District Judge Robert W. Gettleman. She graduated from Yale College and earned a JD from Yale Law School and an LLM from Georgetown. Today, Allison will focus on the standard for litigating a race discrimination claim against the police in a criminal case under the Equal Protection Clause. Welcome, Allison. The history of policing in America is deeply intertwined with the violence of racial oppression. Next slide. These are the words of Professor Stephen Carter, who traces the origins of the modern police force to the slave patrols of the South. Despite this tainted history though, it remains virtually impossible to prove race discrimination by the police in criminal cases. Next slide. In the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander poses this question. How exactly does a formally colorblind criminal justice system achieve such racially discriminatory results? Part of her answer is that we've vested too much discretion in police and prosecutors. The other part is we've closed the courthouse doors to all claims by defendants and private litigants that the criminal justice system operates in a racially discriminatory fashion. Next slide, please. Theoretically, the Equal Protection Clause protects citizens against racial discrimination by the police, right? So a person who believes that the police has discriminated against them on the basis of race and an arrest could bring a civil suit. And if that person's been charged with a crime, then they could move to dismiss the criminal case on equal protection grounds. And this is known technically as a claim of racially selective law enforcement. In practice, it is exceedingly difficult for anyone to mount these kinds of constitutional challenges. As Alexander observes, the Supreme Court has made it virtually impossible to challenge racial bias in the criminal justice system under the 14th Amendment. Next slide. So today, I want to focus specifically on this difficulty of how do you prove race discrimination by the police in criminal cases. I'm first going to discuss the legal framework, the traditional framework, which, which sets a virtually insurmountable standard. Um, then I'm going to talk about recent developments in the federal courts of appeals that are very hopeful and that have relaxed that standard somewhat. And finally, I'm going to propose some additional solutions that would enable people charged with crimes to vindicate their constitutional right to be free from race discrimination by the police. Next slide. For virtually 25 years, the legal standard for all claims of race discrimination by the police in a criminal case 
was the traditional equal protection standard. The word traditional equal protection standards, what the Supreme Court calls it, okay? So the Supreme Court first applied this standard to criminal cases in a case called Armstrong. In that case, the defendant said, these federal prosecutors have discriminated against me on the basis of race. After that, state and federal courts alike all adopted that exact same standard for claims of racial discrimination by the police, okay? So next slide. To establish, given this Armstrong Standards Incorporation, um, to establish race discrimination by the police in a criminal case, the defendant has to prove two things, right? First, the defendant has to prove that the police action created what, the, what is known as a discriminatory effect, and I'll explain that in a sec. And second, they have to prove that, that, that this police action was motivated by a discriminatory intent. The intent prong has long been understood to set a very high bar, and I know Professor Huck's gonna talk about that. But the discriminatory effect prong in the criminal context actually sets an equally high bar. Next slide. To establish discriminatory effect, so we're focusing on the first prong right now, a defendant has to prove that there are similarly situated people, other races, whom the police did not arrest, okay? So that means it's like not enough to show that the police arrested more people of color than white people for a particular crime or a particular operation. You also have to show that white people or non-people of color were committing the same crime and yet were not arrested. To meet the second prong, discriminatory intent, a defendant has to prove that the police intentionally discriminated against them because of their race. Next slide. And to even get discovery, okay, to even get the discovery you need to support a race discrimination claim in a criminal case, a defendant has to present some evidence of both of these prongs. Next slide. In practice, this Armstrong standard creates an abstract right without a remedy. The standard sets up this cruel catch-22. So to obtain any discovery about race discrimination by the police, the defendant has to provide evidence of race discrimination by the police, which is the very thing he is seeking, right? Like, how do you prove discriminatory effect without discovery? How on earth do you identify particular people who by definition had zero contact with the police? It is impossible for a defendant, a person of color, to point to similarly situated white individuals who were not arrested because there will be no record of such people, right? And how can a defendant know who is similarly situated to him without any discovery about what led the police to target him or arrest him in the first place? Next slide. Put this visually, okay, to establish a sufficient discriminatory effect, still on the first prong, to even get discovery, Look at the left side of my chart. The law requires a defendant to figure out the racial composition of everybody arrested for a given crime or, or a given policing operation. And then on the right side, get this, this defendant must then identify a benchmark group composed of similarly situated people not arrested for that crime. And that group has to contain essentially a lower proportion of people of color. There has to be a racial disparity between these two groups. So for these reasons, it is incredibly hard to meet the discriminatory effect prong without any discovery. Next slide. To make matters worse, the discriminatory intent prong is even harder to prove without discovery because someone charged with a crime is not entitled to any information about the police officer's motivations or that police department's enforcement priorities. They're not entitled to see the officer's texts or mess, you know, or emails or anything else uh, that could give them some sense of any racially discriminatory intent, any animus on a racial basis by the police. Next slide. So given all of this, it should come as little surprise that for over 100 years, there has not been one single successful claim of race discrimination by the police or prosecutors in a criminal case. Not one federal case, not one state case. And in only a few cases have defendants even been able to get discovery to support such a claim and to move forward to the merits. Next slide. But the good news is in the last couple of years, three federal courts of appeals have recognized the impossibility of meeting the traditional equal protection standard that I've laid out for you in the policing context. So my clinic spearheaded this change. My clinic um, litigated the first of these cases which was the Davis case in the Seventh Circuit. And we convinced that court 
to distinguish Armstrong in the policing context. And we persuaded them that the police are different from prosecutors and the police are not entitled to the same high discovery standard for allegations of race discrimination. So that was a huge, that was a huge moving forward of the law. Then the third and ninth circuits really built on that distinction. Next slide. These three new cases eliminated the two worst parts of the legal standard for obtaining discovery. They got rid of two things. First, they got rid of that similarly situated requirement for the discriminatory intent prong. And second, they got rid of the discriminatory intent requirement. Um, they, they basically said you have to prove either a discriminatory effect without similarly situated or discriminatory intent, but you don't have to prove both, okay? So, so a defendant has much less they have to do. And in the discussion, we can talk about what you actually have to show to meet this new standard. But the point is, the resulting lower standard enables criminal defendants in these three circuits to get discovery and to litigate challenges of race discrimination by the police on the merits for the first time ever. The total elimination of the discriminatory intent requirement is especially significant and rare. I, I'm not aware of any other equal protection context where that's happened, though I'm sure that's something Professor Huck could, could reflect on. Um, next slide. So this is exciting. Justice Gorsuch recently cited our Seventh Circuit case um, and said, spoke of all of these cases. And he said, these new cases call into question the applicability of Armstrong and the traditional equal protection framework to the policing context. He said, these new cases stand for the proposition that the presumptions of regularity and immunity that usually attach to prosecutorial decisions do not apply equally in the less formal setting of police arrests. The way that my clinic uh, has changed the discovery standard, the way we've moved this ball forward is a great start, but a lot more needs to change to enable criminal defendants to litigate and win claims of race discrimination by the police. Next slide. So here are a couple of proposals for reform. At the federal level, defense attorneys and other circuits need to litigate these kinds of challenges. They need to advocate for that lower discovery standard. They need to take up test cases and change their appellate case law in line with with the changes we've made. But the problem is that most criminal cases arrive at the, arise at the state level, right? So to address this problem in the states, I would propose a solution that's cleaner than litigation and faster than litigation, um, which is state Supreme Courts could enact a rule, a, a court rule that mirrors the lower standard we created in the federal courts and that makes it easier for defendants claiming race discrimination by the police to get discovery. The point of a different discovery rule, and, and courts can legislate, not legislate, sorry, courts can set new discovery rules. And the point of a new discovery rule is that would ensure that meritorious claims could move forward. Um, alternatively, state legislatures could enact such a rule, but I think that's gonna be slower moving and less likely to, to bear fruit. Next slide. Another proposal is that federal and state courts um, should actually also implement a lower merits standard. So I've been talking a fair bit about the discovery standard, but then thinking about litigating this on the merits, you know, the discriminatory intent prong is an absurdity. As Michelle Alexander has explained, proof of overt bigotry will almost never be available in an era of colorblindness. So courts should recognize the prevalence of implicit bias and just abolish this discriminatory intent prong altogether on the merits. At minimum, even if courts don't do that, they should accept statistical evidence as proof of discriminatory intent in criminal cases, which is the norm in the civil context. I believe these reforms are necessary to provide a legal mechanism for policing the police in criminal cases. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Allison. I have to remember to turn, since you're so, we're so punctual, I have to remember to turn this off so it doesn't beep at me. Um, our next speaker is Aziz Huck. Aziz is the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law. His teaching and research interests include constitutional law, criminal procedure, federal courts, and legislation. His scholarship concerns the interaction of constitutional design with individual rights and liberties. Before joining the law school faculty, uh, Professor Huck worked as associate counsel and then director of the Liberty and National Security Project of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law litigating cases in both the United States Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. He was also a senior consultant analyst for the International Crisis Group, researching constitutional design and implementation in Pakistan, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Sri Lanka. 
Aziz clerk for Robert, excuse me, Judge Robert D. Sack of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the United States Supreme Court. Aziz did his undergraduate work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and earned his JD from Columbia Law School. Today, Aziz will focus on the possibilities and limits in the Supreme Court's equal protection jurisprudence in challenging racial discrimination in policing. Welcome, Aziz. Thanks, Professor Buss, uh, and thank you to uh, Professor McAdams and to everyone else who's organized this series of talks. Um, Alison has given you a granular perspective on one particular dynamic within uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the realm of possible solutions to racial discrimination by the police. <clears throat> by contrast, I want to explore how the larger doctrinal structure of equal protection regulates and limits opportunities for policing reform. What I'm going to do is to start with the standard left liberal account of the doctrine, uh, show you how that account goes wrong, and how its error helps us understand where the limits of reform possibility within the bounds of equal protection might lie. Okay, let's start with the standard picture. Equal protection doctrine was inchoate and uncertain up through the mid-1970s. The 1954 excuse me, decision in Brown v. Board of Education, for example, went long on psychological evidence, but took a short position on precise holdings encapsulating the operative principle of the Equal Protection Clause. A decade plus of silence after Brown too left lower courts to creatively back and fill. It was not until a 1976 case entitled Washington v. Davis that what is presently the doctrinal framework snapped into view. Next slide, please. An issue in, uh, next slide, please. Uh, an issue in Washington v. Davis was a police promotion exam for the District of Columbia. The court in Washington v. Davis held that the Constitution was not violated simply because that exam had a disparate racial impact. That is, it burdened racial minorities more than it burdened uh, members of the racial majority. Here, it refused to follow the interpretation it had offered of an anti-discriminatory statutory provision in the 1964 Civil Rights Act in a case called Griggs. Washington v. Davis was applied a decade later uh, in a case called McCleskey v. Kemp. Slide, please. McCleskey held that statistically significant and practically large disparities in the operation of a capital uh, 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 criminal uh, scheme uh, did not warrant an inference of impermissible intent. McCleskey in this regard is simply an application of the principle that we saw playing out or announced in Washington v. Davis. Uh, no less an authority than our own David Strauss has described Washington v. Davis as a turning point. Slide, please. Um, Professor Strauss has suggested that, slide, please. Professor Strauss has suggested that the demand for evidence of intent in Washington v. Davis foreclosed a view of the Equal Protection Clause that turned on disparate impacts. Professor Strauss is unequivocal and speaks for the left liberal consensus when he predicts that had Davis come out differently, had it adopted the Griggs disparate impact standard, quote, the United States might look quite different today. So in this view, the failure of equal protection law to remedy systemic uh, disparities by race is a result of the turn toward intent and the turn away from an effects-based test in the mid 1970s. As Professor Siegler has explained, uh, an intent bait test makes it very difficult to prove the existence of an equal protection violation and therefore provides scant protection for minorities. But would an intent based test really do that much better? Excuse me, would an effect based test really do that much better? Slide, please. Consider here Lewis Powell. Before Powell became a justice of the US Supreme Court, he was an influential lawyer in the Virginia city of Richmond. Relevant here, Powell was a member and then a chair of the Richmond School Board from 1954 to 1961. Powell was hence charged with responding and carrying out the mission of the Supreme Court's rulings in Brown 1 and Brown 2, 
which mandated the desegregation of southern school districts, including Richmond. Did he succeed? In 1961, when Powell stepped down as chair of the school board, there were 2,300 African American, excuse me, 23,000 African American school, school children in metropolitan Richmond. Of those 23,000 uh, black children, two attended school with white children. So it was a success of sorts. Some 12 years later, and two years after President Nixon had appointed him to the Supreme Court, Powell penned a concurrence in a case called Keys versus uh, School District Number One. Slide, please. Actually, this is uh, I, I'm one one slide behind. This is the uh, this is the Richmond School District. Slide, please. Um, in Keys, which was the first major desegregation decision concerning a non-Southern school district, uh, the majority, uh, with Justice Brennan uh, at the helm held that the school district had acted with an impermissible discriminatory intent and therefore a remedy was warranted. Justice Powell concurred, but he would not have ruled on the basis of intent. Rather, as you can see from this quote from his concurring opinion, he would have based the key's ruling on effect. Had Powell changed his stripes? I think not. A decade after this, he would go on to write the majority opinion in McCleskey v. Kemp. I think it's extremely unlikely, therefore, that Powell believed that an effects test for equal protection clause violations would have the destabilizing and transformative effects that Professor Strauss hoped for. To the contrary, Powell's concurrence in Keyes underscored how an effects test would maintain the, quote, freedom of school districts to pursue, quote, quality education free from protracted and debilitating battles over court-ordered student transportation, end quote, that is, busing. Moreover, if we look beyond the Constitution to the way that effects tests have been deployed in statutory anti-discrimination regimes such as Title VII and the Fair Housing Act, we do not find a record of successful social transformation. Rather, as Professor Michael Selmy of George Washington Law School has explained, the disparate impact standard in Title VII, which is the employment discrimination context, has had, I quote, a strikingly limited impact outside of the context of written employment tests and is in fact an extremely difficult theory on which to succeed. Effects tests, that is, don't seem to have much effect. Something then is awry with the standard story. The decision to organize equal protection doctrine around an intent standard as opposed to an effect standard is simply not as important as many believe. To see what a transformative equal protection jurisprudence might look like, consider another striking, if transient, success story. Slide, please. Between the 1960s and the mid-1980s, lower courts implemented school desegregation decrees by focusing upon the extent of effective integration between previously dichotomous school districts. No doubt this litigation had its uh, deep problems, as Derek Bell has explained, but for a brief period of time before the Supreme Court foreclosed it starting in the mid-1980s, this jurisprudence had the effect of changing the socioeconomic landscape of the United States. It chained together in these jurisdictions, the educational fate of blacks and whites for a brief instant. It changed the way that institutional uh, 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 resource, it, it changed the institutional channels through which resources were allocated and the ways in which advantage and disadvantage were transferred between generations. In my view, whether the law of equality can usefully be deployed against the moral catastrophe that is American policing depends upon whether it is possible to recapture and generalize the infrastructural understanding of equality that was briefly instantiated in these desegregation cases. The disparities in police deployments that we see today arose only after the mid-1970s disinvestment in social infrastructure in African-American communities that's been charted by the historian Elizabeth Hinton in her magnificent book, From the War on Crime to the War on Poverty excuse me, from the war on poverty to the war on crime. Today, uh, violent and repressive policing arises out of a matrix of profound socioeconomic disparities 
that are maintained not just by public action, but also by private uh, decisions in the market. Consider the following maps of Chicago. Slide, please. These three maps show, respectively, the distribution of crime, the distribution of policing, and the distribution of socioeconomic disadvantage. I would posit that changing policing means changing not just one of these maps. It means changing all three. Challenging Jim Crow in the schooling context was a big judicial lift. The challenge of achieving just policing is an even more intractable, tractable problem. The lesson of history, I think, and in particular, the lesson of the ultimate failure of uh, courts to install durable integration in the schooling context is that we should be immensely skeptical that the judicial power is incentive compatible and capable, at least as currently constituted, of finding creative ways to meaningfully dislodge the profound and structural conditions of racialized disadvantage that are the premises and the drivers of our nation's policing problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, maybe that's a good place to start. I take it that is a, uh, you know, your, your message is a message, I think, of you could say doctrinal humility or that we need to look elsewhere if I'm understanding that right. And um, Allison's message was very much a message that we can, you know, we can hone the doctrine. It's not quite where it should be, but we're moving in the right direction and we can hone the doctrine. And I, I guess I'd like therefore to invite the two of you uh, to comment on the insights that each of those bring to, to, to the other's presentation. Maybe sure. start with you, I can, Allison. I can start, sure. Um, I, you know, I think, I think what Aziz says um, is fantastic and absolutely right. There's so much, I mean, as somebody who litigates these issues and has spent years litigating some of these issues in court dealing with legal standards, there is so much beyond the legal standards that has to change to actually fix this problem. It, it cannot be fixed in any sense with legal standards. Um, I think at the same time, or by the same token, I feel like there is so much work to be done, even in the sort of microcosm of the legal standards, that there, to me, there is some hope or possibility um, of changing the law that then could ultimately potentially change some behavior, right? Like if we can change the law, if we can actually start holding the police accountable, even, and again, I'll, I'll be very clear, I'm, I'm limiting myself to the context I know, which is criminal cases. But if we could even hold the police accountable for um, race discrimination affected against people in criminal cases alone, I think that would be something, right? I mean, that would, that would go some bit of the way. I agree that it does not do at all everything that needs to be done. Um, and I just want to reflect on one thing that Aziz was talking about, specifically the McCleskey case. Um, you know, I, I fully and wholeheartedly agree with him about the McCleskey case. Um, being, I mean, I've read other works of yours, Aziz, and the McCleskey case being a serious problem and the concern about, look, in criminal cases right now, a defendant cannot present statistical evidence, uh, at least not statistical evidence alone, as proof of discriminatory intent because of McCleskey. And as I told you, it's very hard to present other evidence of discriminatory intent. And especially as people police learn how to not be overtly racist, you need statistical evidence, okay? That's an essential, I think, piece of proving something. And so um, one thing that I agree, I think Aziz and I probably agree on that has to change is, um, and one thing I think that maybe my framework can help change actually is this McCleskey problem because McCleskey arose in the selective prosecution context. It arose in the context of prosecutors the allegation that prosecutors had discriminated, just like Armstrong arose in that context. So my suggestion would be, you know, all of the reasons that I believe we should, that, that, I, that courts did diverge from Armstrong in the policing context, I think also apply to why courts should diverge from McCleskey in the policing context and, and create a different standard, actually allow defendants to use statistical evidence to prove discriminatory intent, at least in policing, ideally everywhere, but if not, if not for everything, at least in going uh, after race discrimination by the police. So that's one piece that I think uh, is another thing that I didn't present already that I think should change. 
Okay, I want to hear from Aziz as well on this, but reminders for those of you here attending that you should send your questions. I, we don't have as many questions as we often do. I want to make sure that you have a chance to, to, to get your questions asked. So this is what, what about, what, is, there, is there any, are you optimistic that there might be a way to have a kind of, I mean, you're really arguing for a kind of police specific carve out and you're contrasting it to the rule developed for the prosecutors. Maybe that's an easier move. Aziz is speaking broadly, you know, about, about equal protection doctrine that has been applied in, you know, quite diverse context using the same standards. So is there any foothold opportunity to, to specialize in the context of policing? I, I, I think I would take the, 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 the problem or the, or the, or the question in, in um, two different directions, which are slightly different from the way that you framed it, Emily. Um, I, the fine. first thing I would I would think through is um, what are the institutional uh, situations, sites, uh, in which progress can be made with respect to uh, equality or, or what I would call anti-subordination or anti-stratification values. And I think that lawyers are trained and are uh, socialized in the context of clerkships and in the context of their first jobs to think about the problem through a relatively narrow lens of particular cases involving particular plaintiffs and defendants. And one of the things that I, I hope people take from what I said is that that uh, uh, lens, which I think is a lens through which court uh, approach the problem of equality is deeply limited. It's intrinsically limited. Um, and the institutional sites at which the values of, uh, that I would argue underlie the Equal Protection Clause, uh, w whether with respect to policing or otherwise, and, and this is why I resist a little bit um, uh, the question, because I, I don't see the problem um, of equality with respect to policing as completely disentangled or, or completely disentangleable from the problem of unequal schooling, the problem of unequal access to the labor market, the problem of radical racial hypersegregation of the kind that Chicago experiences. Um, I, I think that, that, that those, that, that understanding the equality problem in that way pushes you to see that it has to be addressed in some other place. And if you're a lawyer, you have to think about um, where are the platforms or the institutions that I can look to to pursue those values. And it, it might not be through uh, litigation or through the case method. Um, the second thing I'd say is you know, I spent five years, rough give or take, as a lawyer representing individuals. And I, there, I think it was an argument that the individual the litigation that I was um, engaged in was having a structural effect. You know, at the end of the day, I think that that, um, that argument for uh, what I was doing on structural grounds probably didn't co go through. But be that as it may, there were, as in Allison's cases, particular people who were suffering from disadvantage from uh, uh, the weight of state coercion. And it's incredibly important to help those people, regardless of whether your actions have systemic effects. Um, you know, so I, at the end of my five years, I, I came to the view that I was um, arranging or rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, but, you know, I was probably putting a couple of people into lifeboats who wouldn't be there. And that's not so bad a thing to, to say. So maybe on this note, um, I, a follow-up, one of, one of the questions that came in um, is it's, the concern is that your wisdom in this area uh, sort of suggests inaction. Sort of you have to fix everything before uh, you can really fix anything. And maybe I'll combine that with another question that's come in. How much is this about funding? I mean, is it defunding a police movement, which is talking about shifting resources? Is, this a, is that a way in and a way to sort of make material progress in achieving what you're saying, it's not going to be very successfully achieved through litigation. Aziz. I, I, I do think that changing funding streams and changing jurisdictional, uh, uh, shifting jurisdictional responsibilities. So for example, 
uh, uh, changing what uh, police are responsible for, as opposed to say social services uh, uh, are responsible for, are levers that can achieve far more than uh, litigation. Um, you know, it were to be the case that one could get dramatic changes to institutional missions through litigation, were it to be the case that one could get uh, transformations in the fiscal landscape through litigation, then yeah, I would say the litigation would be would be a, a, a promising pathway too. Um, but I, 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 as I think we have seen, um, there are other non-litigation ways through which change can be achieved. The change doesn't have to be aggregate and complete. It can be piecemeal. Um, uh, change is better conceived as a process rather than a, a single miraculous act. Um, and um, just because complex socioeconomic structures of stratification can't be immediately unwound all at one go, doesn't mean there aren't significant and meaningful ways of starting on that project. Emily, can so I step in here? Yes, and I have a question for you as well, Allison, but go ahead and step in and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so I sort of, I, I wanna push back a little bit on what Aziz is saying, um, because in some sense, I see this as one of my missions in life, right? Which is to convince lawyers not to give up on lawyering and not to give up on lawyering as an instrument for systemic change as an instrument for progress towards equality. So uh, the fact is, you know, when I say 25 years passed and, and the law just stagnated and no one proved anything, frankly, for 100 years, that's in part because no one was fighting the issue anymore. Lawyers just gave up. After 96, 1996, the Supreme Court comes down with Armstrong, lawyers give up. They stop trying to fight race discrimination by prosecutors. They stop trying to litigate race discrimination by the police. They just give up. Lots of bad case law comes out that expands Armstrong to the police from prosecutors. Everyone just gives up. Uncle, take me, whatever. It's fine. I just let it go. You know, rather than fighting and fighting back and saying, no, we're going to take this bad standard and we're going to distinguish it. We're going to do what lawyers do. We're going to distinguish it. We're going to fix it. We're going to change it. You know, one thing I tell my students is one, one lawyer with their one brain can change a huge amount and can make systemic change. And I truly believe that. And I feel like one of my jobs as a professor is to empower lawyers and law students to go out and try to make that change. Because I agree, it's hard to do, but it can actually be done. And it can be done with fewer people than you think sometimes if you just try to break down these, these seemingly impregnable walls. Hey, Allison, that's a nice opportunity for me to ask if you'd be willing to talk about the Stash House cases and to give to make this really concrete. Um, sure. That'd be great. Thanks. Sure. So uh, this whole idea, this whole, the, this new legal standard um, came out of some litigation that my clinic did where uh, the ATF was discriminating against people we believed on the basis of race. The ATF was um, actually selecting people uh, through its confidential informants to commit a made up crime, which was the crime of um, rob a fake stash house. Well, go, the ATF would say, hey, there's this stash house full of drugs. It's a great opportunity. How about you and your buddies show up with a bunch of guns and, 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 uh, and rob it? And th this would be an undercover agent. And, and then the uh, 100 people in Chicago alone were arrested for this crime. And it turns out it was all like completely made up. Um, there was no stash house and there were no drugs. And um, people ended up serving often, you know, 20, 30 year sentences based on drug charges, gun charges, et cetera. The federal charges just piled up. And so our clinic's way of approaching this was a lot of people saw this as entrapment and we said, no, no, no. That's not going to, I mean, it may well be entrapment, I think it is, but it's not going to win. So let's go after it as race discrimination by the ATF, which we also thought was going on because almost everybody that the ATF went after for this, 92% of the people were people of color. And so mostly, mostly black men. Um, and so we litigated this issue and the big hurdle, one of the big hurdles was this discovery problem. How do you get discovery about discrimination by the police if you don't have good enough evidence about discrimination by the police to meet this impossible standard. And so we litigated and that's where we were able to convince the Seventh Circuit to look at policing differently and to say, you know, the prosecution may have a presumption of constitutionality and all of that, 
police officers aren't entitled to that. And so we're going to treat the burdens for getting discovery as lower in the policing context than the prosecution context. So that's the essence of, of what we did. And then I think it's very important to point out that after we got this lower discovery standard in the Seventh Circuit case, we were able then to litigate on the merits claims of race discrimination by the ATF for fully 43 individual clients um, in the federal courts, you know, federal district court in Chicago. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we ended up losing um, in one of those cases, and a lot of the judges just didn't rule. And then after we lost in one of those cases, the prosecutors gave us, gave our clients basically these um, incredible plea deals, and most of our clients ended up with time served sentences. But the interesting thing is we lost on the merits because the standard that was set for discriminatory effect was so impossible to meet that even with discovery, <laughs> it was like, unmeetable. So that's the essence of it. But um, I think it was a very good object lesson in how you can make change and how much change still needs to happen. So Allison, we got a question uh, early on about sort of how much does it help to have better discovery? And you're sort of that, you're suggesting that here. What was, what is the information that is realistically available through discovery? I mean, my awareness of what you did on the Stash House cases involved a lot of working with your own experts and, you know, kind of finding the data in other ways. Um, yeah. So uh, what is it that your adversary has that you can therefore get in discovery, but that with, you know, I don't know, what is that? Yeah, kind of so in, um, if, if Richard, you don't have to, but if you wanted to put up that slide that has the two sides of the graph that shows the selected group and the benchmark group, go for it. If not, I'll just talk about it. But what, what you can get through discovery, the really important things you get from discovery is number one, you say, who is in the, uh, here, Richard, I'm not sure. Let me tell you what slide number it is. Um, who is in the selected group? There, uh, wait, actually go, uh, actually, nope, go to, sorry guys. Um, go to slide 11, would you, Richard? Okay. Um, so the question is, who is in the selected group? Who, who has the, who have the police gone, um, you know, who, like in the stash house cases, who did they target to commit this fake made up crime, right? So you got to figure out who's in that group. It turns out that I, operating on my own as a defense attorney, it's very hard to find that out, right? Whereas the prosecutors and the, and the, you know, ATF, they know exactly who, was targeted in that operation. They know exactly who was arrested in that operation, who was charged in that operation. That's one piece of discovery that is, that you, it's hard to reconstruct on your own and it's easily available from the government. And that's something you ask for. The second thing is about how do you construct this benchmark group? Yeah. So you have, to, you have to find similarly situated people not arrested for that, not targeted by the ATF in our instance, right? And the only way you can do that is to figure out what are the criteria on which the ATF is making its decisions. So in our case, it turned out that the ATF was making decisions based on, you know, people with, they said, they purported to be going after people with certain prior convictions for violence and, and guns and maybe drugs, but sometimes they said, no, it wasn't drugs. So it was a very moving target, even when we got this criteria, but at least we got the ATF manuals, the ATF selection criteria that enabled our expert to then build a benchmark group from the same geographic area in the same time period that we believed was the proper group against which to compare our clients. And it turned out that that group was far less um, black than our group. Our clients were 78.7% .7 black and that group was like 55% black. And our experts said, you know, looking at this statistically, this is something that, you know, he basically said, I, there's no, nothing else going on here other than race, in essence, that's an oversimplification. But, my point is, it's still really hard, even if you have the discovery to ultimately prove things, because there's always going to be pushback and discussion about who's in the similarly situated group, are you constructing it correctly, da, da, da. It's, uh, in some sense, as Aziz said, even effect, discriminatory effect alone is not a great standard, because everything I just told you about, the difficulties, that's all just discriminatory effect. And then you have to prove the actual animus, right? So it's hard. So just a couple of questions have come in that if I'm interpreting them properly are interested in the fact that the focus is on race and looking at the numbers into, it sounds like the numbers are also very disproportionately skewing toward men. I believe that's what these questions are trying to get at sort of other categories of discrimination or discrimination based on religion or, you know, is there, is this any of that sort of in the mix of what um, you have been involved in or, or um, have, have looked into, I guess, I'm, I'm quickly trying to interpret questions as I'm seeing them. In the criminal context, it turns out that um, most of the people who are targeted are men. Um, so we haven't, you know, it just turns out that that's who, uh, th that's who the police and the prosecutors tend to go after. It's, 
you know, I have not, I know I have not done religious discrimination or gender discrimination. There is some room to do nationality discrimination in exactly the same way we did race discrimination, very much. Um, one question uh, about whether there's any are examples of or any opportunities that seem promising for state legislation changing the standard that would allow for um, litigation in this area to address discrimination by police. Sure, yeah. Uh, should I, is this me well, or- Why don't we do, do give Aziz a, a crack yes. at it and then- I, I think that there are ample opportunities for, uh, for state regulation and intervention. Um, so in, in Illinois, just to give an example, Illinois has um, a disparate impact statute uh, that does apply to uh, policing uh, and that has been used with respect, for example, to uh, stop and frisk in the city of Chicago. Uh, although uh, not in a litigation uh, context. Um, the, the interventions that I can imagine being uh, effective uh, with, with respect to policing, uh, and let me focus again on Chicago, um, uh, are interventions that in the first instance force the uh, police to disclose the basis of their uh, tactical and strategic decisions about the deployment of resources and to uh, justify the, uh, the decisions to deploy differentially across different neighborhoods uh, and the like. Uh, so one of the uh, issues that, that arises in the, in the context of, uh, of stop and frisk is whether and how uh, increasing the, the number of police citizen encounters in a particular neighborhood um, has an effect uh, on the, the rate of crime and in particular the rate of violent crime. Uh, and you saw this play out, for example, over the July 4th weekend uh, with respect to the, uh, the, police, uh, the Chicago Police Commissioner's uh, proposal to flood or to surge uh, neighborhoods in Chicago uh, and engage in prophylactic ar arrests. Um, I, I think that, that much more information is needed about when and how those deployments are happening and uh, why the police think that they are justified. My suspicion is that a law that required uh, evidence both ex ante of uh, what the plan for deployments is and ex post an examination of whether the deployments actually had any kind of uh, effect on public safety would dramatically decrease disparities in policing uh, in uh, a context, at least like Chicago. Allison, had you wanted to say something? Sure. Um, in the the idea of state court or state rules that are in state legislation that could change things, I actually think there's um, there's a really interesting model for that uh, that the Washington State Supreme Court enacted. So this is not a legislature, this is a court, but again, it's a state court rule. It's fascinating. Um, the problem of race discrimination and jury selection, which comes up in the Batson case, has a similar analogous issue, which is it's a requirement of purposeful discrimination, just like discriminatory intent in, in, in the policing context. And what the Washington State Supreme Court did was they just created a new rule that entirely got rid of the purposeful discrimination um, element, okay? And they said instead, um, they have this objective observer test, which is if an objective observer could view race or ethnicity as a factor, then you've proved your Batson claim, basically. And so it's a dramatic change in the law. It takes out this intent requirement, and I think it should serve as a model for not just this situation with race and policing, but in a lot of other contexts where, um, you know, where we've got these intent requirements that are just insurmountable. Can I, can I add one thing to, to what Alison just said, uh, which is, I think I would go a step further from uh, beyond what Alison just described uh, Washington State doing. Um, I think we have to, to recognize that it's not just the uh, focus on racial intent or discriminatory intent that is problematic. Um, it's the idea that race is playing a role in a world in which, because of past discrimination, there are systematic disparities in uh, uh, economic, educational, and labor market opportunities for people across the color line, it would be astonishing if there were not differences 
in both rates of involvement in and exposure to criminal violence. The real problem, I think, is, is how one deals with a world, how one deals with the problem of crime in a world in which the fact of racial difference is compounded into patterns of socioeconomic, educational, and labor market disparity, right? It's not the idea, and, and, and to, to, to frame the problem of, uh, uh, as, as a matter of race discrimination, or, and I, I don't think this is necessarily what Alison was saying, I think this is just pushing what she was saying a little bit further, to frame it as a problem of race playing a role, I think gets the, it's a fundamental misconception of the problem. The problem is, 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 the problem is already embedded in, compounded in, the distribution of non-racial attributes and entitlements out there in the world. And the problem is how we deal with that reality. It's not how we deal with something called race discrimination. So is it either or? I mean, what if, there, what if we have a layering? And of course, the layering would be very interrelated. Are you saying it's a fool's game or counterproductive to pursue that sort of narrower understanding of race plays a role um, well, I, in I order to get at this underlying yeah, I, so, so problem, I think, systemic you know, problems? Obviously in, in the present political moment, I think it would be foolish to suggest that um, uh, overtly racist statements and overtly racist uh, uh, ideologies no longer play a role in the world. But I think that the effect of these uh, overtly racist statements or ideologies is relatively small in comparison to the effect of a, uh, a, a structure of legal ideology that perceives the problem of race today to lie only in the, uh, the defect of the racist mind or the racist attitude or the bad apple in the police department. So I, I, I resist quite strongly this, this either or. I, I really think we, uh, what, what's primary and what has to be the, the, the focus of attention is, is, is the structural component and not the, uh, uh, the kind of moral assignment of blame for bad attitudes or beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so I want, this is backing up in some kind of a way. There are a, a, some questions of people who are, obviously we have a very, and what, we welcome a wide audience of, with different levels of, of, of knowledge about these areas. And some people are asking pretty, you know, sort of straightforward questions about how we compare, how we think about discrimination as a legal matter when we're talking about policing to, for example, employment discrimination. And I think layered in that question is a sort of understanding of the Title VII versus equal protection. I think that's, that's in those questions as well. So I wonder if one of you could just, you know, give a, lay that out just for those who are trying to make sure they're doing the best job possible of, of tracking the law as it exists today. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but maybe a brief version of that. Either one of you who's, want to take that on. Aziz, you want to take that on? Uh, sure. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, it has been interpreted with respect to race differently from gender, differently from other uh, uh, attributes or, or um, fundamental rights. With respect to race, it, it, the court claims that there is a single standard. Uh, this standard focuses upon intent plus effect, as Alison has described. Um, in practice, the way that the court applies the intent standard uh, means that uh, uh, the effect of equal protection is felt very differently across different domains of government activity. Uh, with respect to uh, criminal justice, and I'd sweep in not just policing, but also prisons uh, uh, into what Allison said about non-enforcement. Uh, the racial component of equal protection is largely a dead letter. Um, and, and some justices, such as Justice Thomas, have gone so far as to suggest that that, that, that really is the way it ought to be, because whenever uh, the coercive arm of the state is, is involved, uh, we just ought to presume that the use of race is, is narrowly tailored to meet a compelling state interest. Uh, in contrast, in other domains of uh, uh, government activity, um, the ban upon intent, and in particular the, the related ban upon classifications that use the term race, uh, 
has a large effect, particularly with respect to um, allocations of educational resources. And this is what we see playing out in the affirmative action uh, debate. Um, you know, it, it is an, it is a, an, an old uh, observation in the academic literature on equal protection, it dates back now 20 years, that the way the court has interpreted uh, the, the equality provision of the Constitution um, effectively means that in those domains of human activity in which African Americans and Latinos tend to be burdened, there is no remedy. And in those domains of human activity where it tends in our day and age for non-minorities to be burdened, the state has to meet an extremely high standard. Emily, I could reflect just briefly on a, a piece of this question as far as like how Title VII maps on to the standard that I was talking about as far as the discriminatory effect standard. So um, the discriminatory effect standard I was talking about, how I laid out for you guys, the selected group and the benchmark group, that really is very similar to if you think about like a failure to hire claim in the Title VII context, right? So in the, in the Title VII context, in a failure to hire case, the selected group is the universe of, um, of, of people, non-white applicants who were not hired, okay? Calling them the selected group, but you see what I'm saying? They were not selected. They were not hired for the job, okay? And then the benchmark group is the relevant labor pool. Um, and, and then the question is, you know, how many people of color from the selected group should have been hired um, based on the available pool of people, and you have to look at the racial composition of both of these pools. So that's sort of an analogy for anybody who's familiar with Title VII to understand what's happening in the criminal context in this standard, and also why it's so hard to meet, and why you need discovery for it. And, and just to add to that, that Title VII has both a discriminatory treatment prong and a disparate impact prong. The disparate impact prong of Title VII has no analogy in the constitutional context, right? So disparate yes. impact is a statutory remedy. It exists in the employment context. It exists in the fair housing context. And it exists under certain state laws, including Illinois and uh, California's. Uh, but it is not the constitutional standard. And it applies to private actors as sort of another distinction, right? So one question, this will be probably the last question that we have time for um, that follows on that is, in the Title VII context, you have pat pattern and practice, the opportunity to prove pattern and practice, not just to prove an impact claim, but also an intent claim. And does that not carry over to the equal protection context? Allison? I'll just say that what, what we tried to do in our clinic case was there's no such thing as a class action in the criminal context, but we tried to essentially create something that was akin to a class action by aggregating, finding every single person in Chicago who still had a live stash house case, and then litigating this claim on behalf of all of those people to kind of do the kind of thing you can do in a pattern of practice case, which is show that we are not talking about individualized discrimination in one person's case or another. We are talking about big, you know, blanket discrimination against a, a larger group of people. Got it. Well, and, we are, and with that, we are out of time. Thank you both so much. Um, and thanks to all who came and who have listened and participated and shared your questions. Please join us again next week when our discussion will focus on policing and substantive criminal law, with a focus on over-criminalization and police defenses. Thanks so much and enjoy your weeks. <laughs>